This is an introductory level example that shows the application of the LRFD load combinations in the ASCE 7 standard to floor and roof loads in a typical building type structure. For this problem, let's suppose that we're examining a building that's subject to the following loads. The floor is subjected to a dead load of 68 pounds per square foot and a live load of 75 pounds per square foot. The roof, on the other hand, is subjected to a dead load of 45 pounds per square foot, a roof live load of 20 pounds per square foot, a snow load of 50 pounds per square foot, a rain load of 15 pounds per square foot, and a wind load of 25 pounds per square foot that causes uplift. It's important to note for this example that the roof live loading is different than the live loading that's applied to the floor. And it's also important to emphasize that the wind loading on the roof acts in the opposite direction as the other loads. All of the other loads are gravity loads and act downwards, whereas the wind load, as it's stipulated in this problem, is an uplift force, meaning that it acts upwards. Here are the seven load combinations that we're going to use for this example. These combinations come from the 2022 edition of the ASCE 7 standard. Note that I've included a coefficient of 0.5 on the live load in combinations 3 and 4, which is permitted in the ASCE 7 standard when the unreduced live load does not exceed 100 pounds per square foot. Also note that combinations 2, 3, and 4 all include L sub R, S, or R. One of the first things that we'll do is modify these combinations to include a roof loading that is taken as the maximum of the roof live load, snow load, and rain load. When we make that modification, the load combinations look like this. And the next thing that we'll do is rewrite these combinations with an R in place of the roof loading. In combinations two and four, I'm using R sub APT to represent the roof loading at its arbitrary point in time level. And in combination three, I'm using R sub MLL to represent the roof loading at its maximum lifetime level. This can be a bit confusing at first since we're using R to denote the rain load in some cases, and then we're using R to denote the roof load in other cases. After you work through a couple of examples though, the utility of this approach should become apparent. Now we're going to consider the possibility that some of the transient and environmental loads may not be acting on the structure at any given time. This really doesn't affect the first combination since the first combination includes only the permanent dead load. When we consider all the possible permutations of the second load combination, however, we first consider the possibility that both the live load and the roof load act at the same time as a dead load. Then we consider the possibility that only the live load acts at the same time as a dead load. Then we consider the possibility that only the roof load acts at the same time as a dead load. And finally, we consider the trivial case where neither the live load nor the roof load act at the same time as a dead load. Next, we'll apply the same idea to load combination number three, which includes live load and wind load and roof load. Applying the same idea to load combination number four, we end up with these eight permutations. And when we apply it to load combination number five, we end up with these two permutations. Next, if we consider all the permutations next to each other, some of the combinations can obviously be eliminated. For example, if we consider the combinations that include only dead load, then it's obvious that 1.4 times the dead load will govern over 1.2 times the dead load or 0.9 times the dead load. Similarly, if we consider the combinations that include only dead load and roof loading, then it should be obvious that 1.2 times the dead load plus one times the roof loading at its maximum lifetime level should govern. If we include the combinations that include just the dead load and the live load, then it should be obvious that this combination will control over the others. When we include the load combinations that include dead load, live load, and roof loading, it should be obvious that this load combination will govern. When we consider the load combinations that include dead and wind loading, it should be obvious that the load combination 1.2 times dead plus 1.0 times wind should govern. The remaining permutations of the load combinations are shown here. When we include the earthquake combinations and account for reversible loads, we're left with 27 unique permutations. There aren't any earthquake loads in this example, however, and in the first part of the problem, there aren't any wind loads or roof loads either. 
So that leaves only the two permutations that are shown here that need to be considered. When we substitute in our values for dead load and live load into these two combinations, it's readily apparent that load combination number two is going to govern with a floor loading of 202 pounds per square foot. Now let's consider the roof. Again, there are no earthquake loads in this problem, so we can eliminate these permutations. Also note that there is no live load L on the roof, only a roof live load L sub R that is included in R sub APT and R sub MLL. Note also that the wind load acts in the opposite direction of the gravity loads, so we can eliminate these combinations. And since the wind load creates an uplift, using a load factor of 0.9 on the dead load will be the critical case. So that leaves only these combinations that need to be considered for the roof. Next, we'll calculate the roof loading at its arbitrary point in time level, as is shown here. As you can see, the snow load governs, and the arbitrary point in time roof loading is 3 times 50 pounds per square foot, or 15 pounds per square foot. Similarly, the maximum lifetime roof loading is also governed by the snow load and has a magnitude of 50 pounds per square foot. Substituting in our values for dead load, roof load, and wind load, we can see that load combination number three gives us our maximum value of 104 pounds per square foot, and load combination number five gives us our minimum loading of 15.5 pounds per square foot. Even though the wind load acts to cause uplift, with the dead load included, even with a load factor of just 0.9, we still end up with a positive or downward loading on the roof for combination number five. It isn't always readily apparent which load combinations are going to govern and which ones can be excluded. So you always have the option of simply working out all the different permutations to find out which one results in the critical loading. That's what I've done here. I've used a spreadsheet in Microsoft Excel to evaluate all the different permutations numerically. As you can see, we end up with the same maximum roof load of 104 pounds per square foot from load combination number three and a minimum loading of 15.5 pounds per square foot from combination number five. Using that same spreadsheet to double check my floor loadings, you can again see that we end up with a maximum floor load of 202 pounds per square foot resulting from load combination number two. Now let's consider a slightly different version of the same problem. Let's consider the possibility that the wind load could cause either an uplift or a downforce. In this case, let's suppose that the uplift has a magnitude of 52 pounds per square foot and that the downforce has a magnitude of 38 pounds per square foot. It isn't uncommon for engineers to have to design for both an uplift and a downforce, and it's not uncommon for those wind loads to have different magnitudes in the two different directions like we're showing here. When we consider this in our load combinations, note that we have to consider both the 38 pounds per square foot downforce and the 52 pounds per square foot uplift to be positive loadings. In other words, we don't substitute a negative value of 52 pounds per square foot in combinations three and five. Instead, we use a value of positive 52 pounds per square foot and leave these negative signs here and here to indicate that this is an uplift force acting opposite to the gravity loads in that case. What these combinations show is that with the modified wind loads, we end up with a maximum roof loading of 123 pounds per square foot and a minimum roof loading of a negative 11.5 pounds per square foot. With this potential for a negative roof loading, we have to take corrective measures to make sure that the roof can't be lifted off of the rest of the structure during a wind event. Typically, you would tie the roof to the structure or you would provide uh, additional dead load in the form of ballast to make sure that the dead load or gravity loads on the roof always outweigh the uplift due to wind. Finally, we can use a spreadsheet to evaluate all of the permutations of the load combinations numerically and show that the values of 123 pounds per square foot downforce and 11 and pounds per square foot uplift are in fact the governing values for the second part of this example. That's it for this example. Thanks.